Thank you everyone for being here. This is the third in our three series of workshops on Syria and the left. Uh, first we spoke about imperialism and anti-imperialism. Uh, the session prior to this was on uh, the emerging red-brown alliances and fake news. Now we're going to try to speak about what is to be done in terms of building an anti-war movement um, that is principled in its orientation and not supporting genocidal dictators and how we can combat those uh, political tendencies who do have a stranglehold on the mechanism of uh, the country's anti-war movement. Um, the speakers will now introduce themselves. John, can you start very briefly? Um, my name is John Rahman and thankfully I'm still a retired carpenter. And um, I do this blog site, OpenSocialist.com. Thank you, John. Um, you, you, yeah. Oh, you, you want me to go ahead? No, no, no. no. Stanley. Stanley, please. Uh, my name is Stanley Heller. I'm from Connecticut, uh, retired teacher, 40 years, uh, AFT member, American Federation of Teachers. I was a president of that local for a while. and. Um, active unionist and uh, worked on Palestine, been involved with a committee we set up called the Middle East Crisis Committee in 1982. And then um, also about five years ago I started working for promoting enduring peace, which is responsible for that. That group started back in 1952. And uh, I'm also active in something that a number of groups created called uh, RPM, Revive the Peace Movement Network. And we'll talk about that a little later. I think that's good for me. Thank you, Stanley. Ann? Um, hi, my name is Ann Eveleth. Uh, for those of you who weren't here in the last panel, um, I'm an activist and writer, sometimes journalist, um, and uh, I've been involved in um, the revolutionary left, in social movements in South Africa, um, in building solidarity movements and now in trying to build a new anti-war movement. Um, and so I just wanted to share that spectrum as my, um, you know, kind of organizational um, background that comes into what I want to talk about around organizations. Hi, I'm Sina Moravage and I'm based in Connecticut. I do work with Middle Eastern Crisis Committee and I also do some research as my background is in public health and I'm trying to build a a framework for how people can rebuild communities using health and wellness as a guiding principle, and I try to bring this to foreign issues as well. Jason. Um, my name's Jason Hitch. I'm a member of Transport Workers Union Local 100 and the Democratic Socialist of America. Okay, I will take one second to fix the matter, and we will see who you are. The chair, the chair wants to see who you are. Uh, I am someone, you guys are right. Um, <laughs> my name is Robert. I'm a supporter of the Socialist Workers Alliance of Guyana. I work as a caseworker in foster care in the city. And I'm a member of the Social Service Employees Union, Local 371. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind people uh, the discussion topic in our abstract, which is what direction should internationalists take in the coming period of class struggle in the U.S.? Should we focus on building a new international socialist leadership? Should we focus on overcoming the crisis of leadership in the U.S. anti-war opposition? Can these tasks be combined? If so, how? What is the relationship between the crisis and the current mass organizing against the Trump regime? And what are the organizing priorities? In a word, or in a phrase, what is to be done? Uh, does anyone have preferences on going first, or should we just go down the line? I'll go clean up. <laughs> You'll go clean up. OK. And John, are you ready? Uh, I guess. Uh, I can? OK. Move I'm sorry. So, the so uh, one second. And? Somebody who can take um, good notes because this is a workshop and we're trying to get people's ideas and we use them. I'll try to take some notes as well. Um, since it's a smaller audience, we're going to try to keep things more informal. We haven't broken into like a circle just so we can maintain the video recording. 
So if something comes up very pressing while someone is speaking or soon after they speak, you don't necessarily have to wait for the round of discussion. Just put your hand up and we'll acknowledge you so that question can be answered. <coughs> With that, John. So about how much, how long do you want us to speak for? That? Ten minutes. So give us, give me a note after five, okay? Well okay? So, uh, comrades, any discussion about how we proceed, ha I think has to start with a sense of perspective. And we saw in 2011 an upturn in the global struggle of the working class, starting with the Arab Spring. You saw the Marikana miners and, and the, uh, the Occupy movement here and so on. And most of those movements in one way or another were defeated. And that led to a downturn in the class struggle and actually a period of reaction. And now there may be signs that the, class, that the working class is starting to recover. You saw in France the big protest there, I interestingly exactly 50 years after the 1968 protest. And here in the United States we've had this whole wave of teacher strikes and Another thing that has received just about zero press attention, I, is dear to my heart, is up in western Washington, in, in the western part of the state of Washington, the Carpenters Union, uh, they have a contract that's come up, and the union leadership, as is absolutely typical, negotiated an absolutely rotten contract in a period of full and over full employment. And that contract has been voted down, within a month has been voted down twice by a two to one margin each time. And there's several other building trades contracts that are coming up there. And just recently, some rank and file members of some of the various building trades uh, unions organized a unity rally. That was just this last uh, Thursday, I believe it was. And both in the case, and of, both in the case of the teachers, and also in the building trades up in Seattle, what's generated it has been full employment on one hand, which give, has given workers a certain uh, confidence, and also a rebellion against their own leadership. That was certainly the case in the teachers and, and also amongst the carpenters. And, you know, I had a debate with the um, executive secretary of the Building Trades Council in Alameda County that's in, in my area in California, where he was supporting, or they were supporting, uh, building a baseball stadium right across the street from like the central uh, community college. It's kind of the center for working class youth in Oakland. It would have wrecked that college. And of course they were supporting it. And in the discussion, he said, yes, we are the slaves of finance capital. And of course, wh which he's right about that. But what he meant is we should be the house slaves, not the Nat Turner slaves. And that is absolutely typical of the role of the union leadership right across the board here in this country. Um, and so to, on the practical level, as far as where we go, most of us operate in uh, are active in urban centers where the unions are quite prominent. And we have to connect with the unions and the struggle of the unions, but one, it's worse than a mistake, it's all, it's, I think you could put on the level of, of a betrayal, that the left has done is, in connecting up with that, they simply support the unions without a thing, single word to say about what has to be done, how the unions have to be changed. And by doing that, they can't link up with the rank and file. And so any struggle around, um, uh, around the any uh, campaign around uh, international issues such as Syria, we have to link it up with the class struggle here at home. And I think that's an important part of how we have to, of how we have to do that. Now there's another issue. As we know, we have a little bit of a political issue here in the United States. And there's mass political confusion within the working class, and I think that that confusion can be defined by the historical absence of a working class political party in this country. That is to say, a mass organization where the most conscious and the most fighting workers can come together, can 
organize themselves, organize their campaigns, and also can discuss all the issues that come up from the, point, from the class point of view. From how does that affect us as workers, and how can we as workers resolve this problem? Whether it's the question of wages, whether it's the question of racism and sexism and so on, whether it's the question of the environment, or whether it's the question of Syria. And I think that, in, 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 uh, as I said, we have to raise the, the international issues connected with the local issues and, and the class struggle here at home. And I think that part of what we have to do is link that up with the necessity of building a mass working class political party here in the United States. And I think we can start by something I've been advocating for DSA, that DSA should do, is run working class socialist candidates, independent of and hostile to the Democratic Party at the local level, where you can actually have an effective campaign. And I want to say, and there might be, in fact, I'm pretty sure there'll be disagreement amongst us on that. That's good to discuss that. My experience is you cannot do that. You cannot ex run a campaign like that and explain that all wings of the Democratic Party represent ca uh, the owners of capital, represent big business, and that what we need is an alternative. You can't, and you cannot do that and at the same time support not one single Democrat. Because how can you do that? How can you justify supporting a representative of the capitalist class when you're saying we need to have our own representatives opposed to that? My experience is it just can't be done. <clears throat> so, just in conclusion, you know, we have a world that's been drawn together more than ever before in history. And in some ways that's acted to the detriment of the working class, but also it's enabled us to contact, for, for the working class to be in contact with each other throughout the world. I must have 20 Facebook friends who are in Syria in, in, or, or in Turkey. That would have been impossible years ago. And so we have to link up these, uh, uh, you know, the class struggle campaigns, the international campaigns, with a discussion uh, on, on, an, on an international level of what is the state of affairs, how can we move forward, how can we learn jointly from the struggle here, the struggle in Syria, and so on. Um, I think that is an important part of the peace movement. And we're actually in our own tiny little way starting that process through these discussions here. And to continue that on, to understand that a discussion about uh, perspectives and program is a, a vital part of any kind of movement that, that we are trying to build. And um, I think just in conclusion, you know, we might face a really rough time in the, in the coming months and years because it might be that we'll face even worse reaction and that will have an effect on the left. But I think, th and, and it'll get even more confused, but I think that what we're doing in trying to hold true to the real values of socialism, which starts with the call for international working class solidarity, that that call and applying it in every situation, whether it's a strike of construction workers or whether it's the Syrian revolution, applying that in a concrete way that is a vitally important task that we are trying to figure out how to take up. Thank you, John. Before we move on to Stanley, are there any quick questions for John? Stanley? Oh. You had a question? Yeah, I, I just had one quick clarifying question. You were saying we should run um, support workers' candidates but not ever support any Democrat. Correct. So we should have supported Trump in the last election. No. I mean, do, should, should we get into this exchange right now? Well, it, okay, that I'm leaves sorry. the groundwork okay. for a good discussion to come. Okay, right. I will, I, I'll, right. I'll, I'll hold that back. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood you mm -hmm. Okay. I don't say Trump is the lesser evil. Okay. All right. Is that sorry, no, no, I just, I read that moment. I just okay, yes, let's see if it does.
suggestion. Is it possible to hear all the speakers at once and then what does it mean? Yeah, sure. yeah, we can do that. Um, the, the only time we're checking if there's a quick question that the person can answer. We're not going to do a whole thing. All right, Stanley? Okay, so our t panel is formally t entitled the, the Movement We Have, the Revolution We Need, and What Should Be Done. Um, I want to talk about the movement, uh, or let's say the predominant movement. Just one section of it, and well, it could be called an important section, UNAC. Um, my, my point is going to be that there are these organizations, they are lousy politics, but they're paper thin and they don't really have much popularity. I helped build UNAC, um, and, and our organization in Connecticut was a big part of it. And if, I forget the year, maybe 2010 or 11, we had a conference, a UNAC conference in Stanford. There was 500 people. Uh, Stanley, just for people who don't know, can you explain? Uh, UNAC is United there? National Anti-War Coalition. Um, and the last convention they had, they had 70 people, all right? Now, we had been in with them, and then we broke. What was it about? It was about the Palestinians. Not the Palestinians in the occupied territories, but the Palestinians in Syria, right? And specifically, Yarmouk camp. At the end of Dece December, end of 2012, Assad put all of Yarmouk under siege. Long history, but this is what happened. And so some of us went up to the steering committee or whatever it was called and said, why, well, we got to, you know, stand with the Palestinians. And Well, this needs more study. And so it was put off a month and another month. And it was clear that these people did not want to talk about it. And, and so at that point, we, we left. And their politics only got worse. And so they're now, um, despite what uh, one fellow said in the first session, I mean, they're really apologists for uh, uh, not doing anything to support the Syrian people. So that's, you know, one organization that we have. But again, it's, it's paper thin. The, there was a spring action, April 15th, I think it was, this year. All of these groups decided, you know, let's do an anti-war thing. Well, which is a good idea. Um, but they, their, their politics was only going to talk about U.S. and its cr many crimes and would refuse to say anything about Syria, so we, we didn't take part. And it was a flop. I wrote about it um, in New Politics magazine, you could look it up, and it was called Anatomy of a Flop. They had planned for months, they were supported on paper by scores of groups, I think like 80 groups, some of them that seemed to be substantial. And the demonstrations took place, were supposed to take place two or three days after Trump bombed Syria. So that would have enraged people and they would you know, come out in the thousands. So in DC they had 60 people. 60 people in Washington, DC. In Chicago it was about the same. In L.A., maybe a couple hundred, and the biggest one was in New York City, 400 people. Um, you know, they, they are not uh, hitting a court. They are not, uh, you know, getting people behind them. They're, they're there, they're talking, and it looks to people like they are the left. But um, their support is only paper thin. So what should we be doing? Well, one thing is, is not worrying... Uh, I don't know how to put it, but um, I think we wasted a lot, I think Syrians wasted a lot of time appealing to the U.S. government, to o Obama, to Trump, whatever. Um, I mean, I can understand why, you know, it looks like they have the power and they could snap their fingers and do things, but they were, you know, there was no interest in that. Obama was not interested in Syria. He had his, his other of things going on, and Trump, my God, he sure is not interested in helping any Arab people. Um, we have to, you know, organize ourselves. I, there's the Irish phrase, Sinn Féin, ourselves alone. You know, we have to get to the working people, the common people, whatever you want to say, the, those classes that are oppressed, explain the situation, and try to think of practical projects. Now, one of them is to help the refugees. And Anand Gopal last week really put it together and he said, look, 
It's not, you know, don't consider them just poor, unfortunate, desperate people. He says, they're the revolution. Why did they run away? A lot of them ran away because, you know, they had been out in the streets and they saw their friends killed and tortured and they knew they had to go. So we have to get them in the country as many as we can, get them situated and then talk to them and find out their stories and let that stuff get out there. Okay. Uh, another thing is to support the white helmets. Um, Trump has frozen their money. They, they, the U.S. gave 33 million to the white helmets over six years. I mean, you could buy high schools for for less than money than that. Uh, it's a small amount of money. Whatever we gave, gave should be increased. And, and I think people, you know, talk to people and they can understand it. Uh, you know not to the left and try to win them over. Go to the firefighters, you know, go to medical personnel, people who do that kind of stuff, you know, talk to them. And I, I think that's a decent uh, campaign. Another thing is picketing the Russian embassy. Um, we, there's a Russian embassy in Manhattan and uh, the Syria Solidarity New York City tried uh, picketing them we went there, it was just a small group of people. We went there and the cops, they have a police station across the street, and the cops came up with us with a court order. They said it was a court order. It was written, it was all typewritten from the 80s that they said you can't pick it in front of the Russian embassy. And it had to do with the fascist Jewish Defense League had done very violent things and so they got some kind of injunction. I mean, it's past 1983, you know, uh, things should be, we should go to court, or we should get on both sides of that, that, that uh, street. We should go in and get arrested. But, but, you know, I think people in this country would be sympathetic to picketing the Russian embassy. Another thing is uh, the, the airport. Aeroflot is the Russian airlines. You know, for three years now, Russian pilots bomb anything they can in Syria. And then many of them go on for their careers in air, air, airline industry, and in Aeroflot in particular. Why do we not object in the airports for these planes coming in there? We should go in there and do something creative. We did it when Trump uh, you know, did the anti-Muslim ban. Thousands of people went into airports. They're a place you can do things. One last thing is a, a missed opportunity. Uh, the World Cup this month is going to be in Moscow. Um, Avaz sent a petition out and said, you know, move it or, you know, boycott it. And in three days they had 800,000 signers. But then nobody did anything more with it. And um, it's probably too late, late at this point. But we got to think of things like that. You know, BD, I don't know about the S part. But the boycotts, divestment, things that will, you know, embarrass the, the Russians, the Iranians, those type of people, or worse, you know, hurt them where they, it hurts the most in the pocketbook. Uh, finally, uh, got a couple minutes left, um, is, is to actually revive the peace movement. And we've started, you know, a number of groups have started something called RPM, Revive the Peace Movement Network. And uh, it started in the spring of 2016. Medea Benjamin of Code Pink, Kathy Kelly of Voices for Creative Nonviolence, Mark Colville of the Kings Bay Plowshares, uh, the late Joanne Landy of the Campaign for Peace and Democracy, Ashley Smith of International Socialists, my own organization promoting enduring peace. We have a listserv. We have a website, rpm.world. Not a .org, a .world, because we have big ambitions. rpm.world. We have two new steering committee, uh, committee members, Yasser Munaf from the Global Campaign in Solidarity with the Syrian Revolution, and Stephen Shalom, a well-known academic and an editorial uh, editor at uh, New Politics, and so on. And, you know, we haven't done anything revolutionary yet. I mean, we bounce around ideas, we make resolutions, we voice support for protests, but, you know, we're an anti-war coalition in development. And, and you know, the other groups really, uh, you know, are gone. And we have to, we have to build something new. Um, 30 you know, seconds. RPM.world. 
rpm.world, rpm.world. Is that trying to be nationwide or just New York area? <laughs> <laughs> dot world. world. Oh, dot right. universe. <laughs> No. Thank you. Right? That's it. That's it. Okay. Um, whew, lots of things to respond to. Um, and, and, and not sure um, how to, I don't want to just get into a one on one uh, thing about it. I think that. Um, so I'm also, um, a, a, as a member of the anti-war committee, I'm going to say a long name and then I'll come back to explain why it's so long and why I want to keep it that long. Um, it's called the Anti-War Committees in Solidarity with the Struggles for Self-Determination. Um, when we don't want to say that that long, we call it AWCs um, and just hyphenate it. But the reason for the long word um, is because we are positing an argument um, that, in fact, solidarity, direct solidarity with the struggles for self-determination wherever they are, whether they're in Syria or Yemen or, or Iran or Venezuela or wherever else, the democratic revolutions around the world are actually the key to ending war. It is actually the antidote to war, is the antidote to, you know, state terrorism by whether it's the US or, or Russia or Iran or Saudi Arabia or whatever states are, are waging terror. Um, but it's also the answer to sectarian terror, whether it's ISIS or Al Qaeda or, you know, other uh, forms of terrorism in other countries. Um, so we, we're, we're really trying to link those two things together. Um, now, at the same time as trying to link those t two things together, we're also trying to link together with other anti anti-war, other genuine principled anti-war activists who, like us, you know, believe that um, the corrupted Assadist, apologist, um, anti-war networks of ANSWER, UNAC, um, UFPJ, the United Peace Council, and various other licorice all sorts um, of Assadists um, sprinkled across the left and here in the left forum. Um, are, are at least ideologically a spent force, but organizationally we need to answer that. Um, we need to, you know, build a real answer to answer and, and friends. Um, and so we are together also in, with Stanley in the Revive the Peace Movement um, network, um, where there are other, other organizations as well. Um, and, you know, definitely support the idea that, that you know, the way forward is, in, involves, you know, at a very fundamental level trying to build an anti war coalition. Um, but now the, the question we're trying to address in this um, panel um, sort of poses that as, a, as, as one side of a coin with the other side being let's build a new, you know, kind of uh, socialist organization or a new uh, push for, you know, organizing the working class, um, which John articulated. Um, but I don't think that they're, you know, in, that those two things are in opposition, right? I think that a lot of us who are interested in supporting and building solidarity with the Syrian revolution are doing it from a socialist internationalist um, standpoint. And what we're actually trying to rescue from the, the, the corrupted movements, from the Assadists, is in fact the very notion of internationalism. Um, and so, you know, we, we are socialists doing that. Um, whether or not it's the time to, you know, uh, build a new socialist um, organization, I think is, is you know, uh, another question. Uh, because I think um, what people were saying earlier is also very true. That we are not going to graduate out of having the same discussion about Syria every year and several times a year until we actually can move to building a mass movement. And so, um, as a socialist and as somebody who's been involved in mass social movements as well, um, I know that as soon as we label a movement socialist, um, then we are effectively telling anybody who hasn't, for whatever reason, you know, embraced socialism as, as an idea that they feel like, you know, getting in the streets and struggling for, right? And there are various reasons why people wouldn't, um, you know, some of it is, you know, long time propaganda in this country, but some of it is also, you know, examples like, um, you know, people being in Syria, you know, raised under the brutality of a regime that claims to be socialist and then, you know, suffering a genocide at its hands. Um, and so maybe organizing for socialism isn't, you know, I mean, there were active socialists, there have been active, so active socialists involved in the Syrian revolution from the start, but, you know, it, it is not a socialist revolution. Um, and so, you know, as soon as we say it has to be a socialist anti-war movement, um, we are effectively saying there's no place for somebody else. And so I actually want to bring us back to Lenin and say, you know, what we actually need to do is build not just a coalition, but an actual united front, right? 
an anti-war movement that deliberately seeks to stretch out and bring people together in a uni united front that does focus on the interests of the working class, um, but also reaches out to people from across the political spectrum um, who in different sectors are interested um, or can be persuaded to become interested in stopping endless war. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that points us to um, war and anti-war organizing right now being so urgent is the continuation of the war on terror and the fact that the language of the war on terror um, has been, you know, it, it, it's sort of accompanied this flip. Um, from genuine anti-war activism um, when we all, you know, across the world stood and, I mean, that was an amazing thing. We marched across the world, millions of us, on the same day against the Iraq War. Um, you know, and, and that was, you know, a time when we opposed the Iraq War, but we also opposed the war on terror. Remember that George Bush declared the war on terror. And we opposed, you know, all of the language and ideology <laughs> that backed it and arose from it, which was Islamophobic and Orientalist and, you know, all about just sort of saying, oh, you know, m the Muslim world, you know, um, is, is, you know, engaged in these ancient conflicts and there's nothing we can do about them and, and, and all of that. Um, and at that time, the, pardon me? Five, Five minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll be less than that. Um, so at that time, you know, on the left, we had pretty wide agreement of rejecting the war on terror. We outright rejected it, right? Uh, we opposed the war on terror and we opposed the war on Iraq. Um, we opposed Islamophobia. We looked down on Orientalism <coughs> as rightly as, as a form of racism. Um, and then we come to the Arab Spring when activists across the Arab world, many Muslims, are taking history in their own hands and basically leading us forward in, you know, out of a morass into a new moment in history. They are seizing history. And, you know, it's just, it, it was an amazing thing to see, but instead we decided to adopt. And I, when I say we, and that I am referring very loosely, and I don't include necessarily any of us who are actually interested in this topic, but um, I, I mean the left in a very loose uh, phrasing, including the Assadists, um, adopted the language of the war on terror, right? And so now, since then we see, um, you know, people like Max Blumenthal and Ben Norton and, you know, others, Rania Kalik likes to do this, um, waving these um, terms like the, what, what is it, the Zaya Wahhabi? Zaya Wahhabi. Yeah, Zaya, Zaya, Zaya Wahhabi, Wahhabi jihadists, right? Right. So you know, everyone in the Muslim world, all all Sunnis are Zaya Wahhabi um, jihadists, right? Um, and so we actually use Islamic phobic and. Um, language to enter into the very sectarian conflicts that we claim are unresolvable um, and that we blame on Muslims. But there we are, we're waging it. We're, we're, we're gonna, you know, bash the Sunnis on, on behalf of the Shia. Is that a mission for the global left? Really? You know? Um, so anyway, um, I think that uh, the war on terror um, is, it has been a, a frame that um, has shifted from a weapon of, of, of the right um, was opposed by the left is now adopted by sections of people who call themselves the left who are actually in bed with the right. Um, and fighting against the war on terror can be a very um, strong basis um, for us to build a mass-based, united front, um, anti-war movement um, that stands in deliberate solidarity with struggles for democracy and self-determination in Syria, Iran, Yemen, Egypt, Palestine, and across the world. Thank you. Thank you, and um, could we send this around the sign-up sheet? Sure, we're going to send around the sign-up sheet. Uh, please put your contact information on there and pass it back around. Uh, before we move on to Sina, for people who stepped in late, I'd just like to remind you that this is the discussion on how we can build a revived anti-war movement. And um, just to recap briefly, uh, what the earlier speaker said, John right here was talking about how it would be effective to run independent socialist candidates not on the Democratic Party ticket as one strategy uh, in response to the international context of defeats of workers' movement. Um, Stanley pointed out that he was one of the co-founders of UNAC, but broke 
the United Anti-War Coalition broke with them over their lack of support for Palestinians within Syria, and he put forward some very concrete suggestions such as supporting the White Helmets, picketing the Russian Embassy, RPM, not world, and mm -hmm. organizing with refugees most of all. Um, so, Sina. Hi, so I think one of the traps that we get in Syria, especially on the left, is that we don't escape the geopolitical narrative that's created by the colonial powers. And if you reduce it to geopolitics, there's only real, two real solutions. There's the solution of supporting Assad and hoping him and Russia uh, win the war, and we know the implications of that. And then the other end is that the U.S. Uh, pursues regime change and puts a U.S.-friendly backed power which um, is also objectionable. Given that we sh there should be no judgment towards anyone who is in a war zone or worried about their family and wants to appeal to the most powerful nation that has the ability to save them from the bombing, there should be no judgment or criticism of that. But however, people working outside the state apparatus, especially us on the left, our job is to provide a better alternative and to find a solution. So if you stop framing this as a geopolitical issue and frame it in their two, I'm going to propose two organizing frames to look at Syria and then conversely more countries, and I'll give more examples including Rojava and Libya, is that we should frame this as both a com racial justice issue and a community building issue. Sometimes uh, as, uh, we'll see that people on the left will consistently say, um, question people who are fighting for Syrian independence. They'll say, Oh, um, I heard, I've seen people call um, Syrians trait like white, white people calling Syrians traitors to their own country. I've had people give me very virulent, hateful looks and like said really terrible things to me. I've heard, heard, told, heard people say, don't talk to Syrians because um, they're just people who are mad that Assad's, they lost their land to Assad's land reforms. And this is a racist issue. It reminds me of how when Black Lives Matter tries to talk about police brutality, not all of them are extremists, people will say, wait, so you hate cops. It's an intentional invisibility of people on the ground, and we need to get past this. Uh, and the other frame I was gonna say is that we need to um, make this, frame this as a community building exercise. And, because we don't have that level of community right now. But I want to focus on some common denominators in Syria and then Rojava and Libya and then talk about a different organizing frame. So in Syria, many people know this, so I'll just run through this quickly. We know that it wasn't just mass protests. It were local groups that were coordinating protests and handing out media that turned, uh, escalated their actions when the Assad regime cracked down on them. They created autonomous governing communities that went well beyond the functions of the state in terms of providing an outlet for grief for citizens, pro providing health care, and actually coordinating repair of infrastructure. Then we see in um, Rojava in northern Syria, where people were invaded, the people there were invaded by ISIS. A lot of the elements of the community were under attack and they rallied themselves, and they have no state backing right now. And right now they're rebuilding their economy from scratch. They're building local co-ops, including agricultural co-ops, include and um, f with a focus on women's rights and one famous example is a Jim War agricultural co-op. And then we see in Libya. Libya is in a, on the verge of becoming a failed state. There's two imperialist powers that are destroying their country. On one end, there's General Haftar in the east who's backed by the LNA and um, what he, he's destroying a lot of local municipal governance. And on the other end, there's the government of national accord which is Western-backed, and then to meet the needs of the West, to, to meet the demands of the West on the war on terror, there to fight 600 ISIS fighters. They rally militias to fight ISIS for them because they need to appease the West for their strategy. And what happens is that these militias are <coughs> holding slave auctions, they're pl uh, plundering the treasury. But within this framework, the most trusted institutions in Libya are local and municipal governance, government, like local and municipal governance, which have taken the reins on diplomacy, become leaders in management and coordination in a way that neither of these two governments are. And so I see a common theme is that when you look beyond the geopolitics and look beyond the borders created by the colonial states, you see everywhere you go, there are people willing to show up for their community. And one thing that is amazing to me is that 
these people don't call themselves socialists. They don't call themselves anarchists. They just make a conscious effort to show up for their community. And they embody the ideals of socialism, communism, anarchism better than any theorist that I've ever met. But there, the tragic thing is that if we don't step up, these people, are, their struggle is going to get erased. Because if you're a local council, your military cannot match the military might of a Russian-backed dictatorship or a US-backed militia. So we need to focus our solidarity campaigns on protecting and building these institutions. Um, so the main issues with these groups are funding and security. Right now, we do not have the apparatus to provide security for these people. But what we can do is fo focus on divestment campaigns. And this will change day by day. So right now, Russia is doing terrible things in Libya and Syria. Stan earlier proposed um, protesting at airports. We should bring a message and <coughs> communicate to them um, that, and ha have a mu mutual struggle brought together in the community. And then there's always funding. You know, there'll be hundreds of fundraisers in Syria on, um, on, on health care or in Rojava in Syria. They need funding for their agricultural projects. They need funding for their health care, for their media, for their infrastructure repair. And so now that we're going into a globalized world where people are in contact with each other, you have Facebook friends from people in these countries, we need to have a conversation where we need to be immersed in these communities and very aware of their struggle. And one of the last things you can do is some people are traveling there. And one of the interesting things about the Rojava revolution is it's recruited a lot of people from England and the US and I believe to an extent Germany and some other European countries to go and help them. But one of the biggest weaknesses right now is the lack of dialogue. Um, right now the armed forces that represent the Syrian revolution are at war with the armed forces that support the Rojava revolution. And so what we need to do is to continue to build an international dialogue and that means, uh, you know, obviously we need to theorize, we need to plan, but meet people. And uh, every, every community from every nation will have big gatherings. You know, there, uh, there's the Kurdish community is very active in New England. Syrian community is pretty active in New England as well. I don't know, I don't have a personal connection to the Libyan community, but my understanding is that uh, it will be there. So I think our job as activists is to promote dialogue between these groups and start to support them and say, how can I show up for you? And also, sometimes when you're not in the conflict, it's easier to talk about differences. Right now, there's no, it's going to be hard to get the Free Syrian Army to talk with the YPJ. But it's not impossible to start a dialogue between the Syrian communities and the Kurdish communities here in the US. And we have to, we have to be aware of our roles, of course. You know, I'm an Iranian American, and my home country is committing atrocities against Syria. So I have to go with this and approach my community and tell them that what we're doing is uh, we're complicit, not intentionally, but indirectly complicit in um, a larger battle, and that we need to learn to talk to people and let go of our, like, our divisions. And so when you have these frameworks, um, you can start to build something new. And I was going to bring these up as an introduction, but I wanted to bring up an example of um, Standing Rock. Standing Rock started off as pipeline resistance. Cena, you have two minutes, okay? Okay. It started off as pipeline resistance, but people willing to show up and learn each other's stories and learn Native American stories. Osedi Salkoen camp turned into a, a city of 10,000 people that were working full time. So I think the important thing, the important takeaway is that if we want to build socialist society, if we want to build an anarchist society, if we want to build a socially just society, we need to start a dialogue and get beyond your theories. I think you have to call out people who are, show racist behavior towards Syrians. Like, you don't question why someone wants their people to be stopped from a genocide. You can ask clarifying questions. And then you have to learn to show up and just be of service to people, learn to listen to their struggles, learn to uh, understand what your role is and how you can help. And once you have that indirect, that communication and are immersed in an, in an environment of information where you know what people's struggle are, then the solutions become easy and you don't end up taking reductionist positions like, I guess I'll go with Russia or I guess I'll go with the US. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you to my co-panelist, and I, some of what I have to say, I think, will be trying in some ways to make what Cena proposed more, not necessarily more concrete, but kind of 
in relation to that. But uh, I guess um, this isn't necessarily a disagreement with the other co panelists. What I'd say, for instance, like Stan, your ideas I think are very good. The, the bigger, not necessarily bigger, it's not a competition, but <laughs> for those protests, we need more people to show up to them. And protests do help build future protests, possibly, but I think that there is a question, a more um, an immediate question of that the majority of the left, as I discussed in other panels, and I think people would agree with that, they're confused on Syria, quote unquote. They haven't been exposed to the right information there. They don't necessarily have worked out bad positions. We need to reach those people to be able to have a bigger movement to do these different things that we're talking about. I think is a strategic priority. Because what we're confronted with is a lot of the publications, the organizations, the institutions either have bad positions on Syria or just aren't doing enough. But clearly, after eight years, we're not in a position, we're not powerful enough to change that or else we would have done that already. So then the question to me is how do we reach those people in the middle to get that power, to build that capacity? And I think a lot of it is just old school organizing, like talking to people face to face, going to a church and showing a documentary on the white helmets, going to existing organizations not to change the top leadership, but if they're decentralized like the DSA, the Democratic Social of America, finding the people that want to, as Cena said, show up and support people and then through that experience they will see why this is important and I think we have a real opportunity to do that work as people in solidarity with the Syrian revolution that if we go into these different spaces and so I want to talk about some particular spaces one is that there's a, a lot of the left I feel like is is anti-liberal in a knee-jerk way and so there's the resistance to Trump which on parts of left Twitter is like a joke hashtag resistance um, Organizing Upgrade has a good article critiquing this, by the way, um, if people are familiar with that publication, but you can Google it. And I, I feel like for the people that sort of got more involved in politics because of Trump's election, our natural audience for taking the story of a revolution and a counter-revolution by Assad. Trump is America's Assad. Not to minimize the total war Assad has unleashed, but in terms of like the type of person they are, the type of rule they represent, that story, that narrative then, I think is an easy sell. And my experience, like, my experience has been that, quote unquote, liberals are more, you're more able to talk to them about Syria than you are leftists that have been poisoned by these various ideologies. Um, so I don't know though, part, like, the best way to reach them though. So partly it's a proposal for if people have ideas on how to do that, like there's the group Indivisible. Um, I'm not sure if there's a good way to like, get them like how how to talk to people i'm not sure more concretely like how to find them and share these stories but i think it's a natural audience to build support for syria but also these other communities too um john talked about labor work um the hawaiian teachers union just endorsed the tulsi gabbard's opponent do people see this it's really amazing it's the it's the only instance i've seen of american union doing this not just on syria almost any international issue they endorsed her opponent and they said part of the reason was is because she supports Assad, the dictator, and uh, opposes human rights. And it's a really amazing thing to see a union like stand up for people in another country, in this country, that's amazing. In other countries, it's more common. In my union, I haven't been able to really do anything, so I don't, like, if people have ideas on better ways to do that kind of union work, I'm interested, but it's been an uphill battle, so. Um, that union came out of a, a struggle a few years ago, so it's a bit of a different situation than many unions. Um, it, it sort of presaged the recent teacher struggles. They had a struggle over wages there, and the people leading that struggle were rank and file that then got elected to leadership. So, <clears throat> um, the sort of net sort of project I put forward for consideration is like, if we can. Um, sort of institutionalize this idea of these communities talking to each other. Like, um, shit, I'm sorry, I forget what group it was. A group was doing weekly video chats with people in Eastern Ghouta. They would have them on Skype on YouTube and everyone could watch like a doctor and an activist and a teacher in Eastern Ghouta under the bombardment talk. And then people could talk about that experience. So just- That was a group related to the Syrian American Council. Yes, that's right, yeah. yeah. But just doing, like, doing things like that on a regular basis, saying 
these are these people going through this experience, Syrians in particular, but it could be anyone, the most affected by an issue, giving them a platform and then having people listen to and then talk about that with each other and then connecting that to like, it doesn't have to be a newsletter, but I call it a newsletter of sharing these stories of civil society, like particularly in Syria, but it could be beyond Syria. So like Kesh Malek, if people know that organization, it, they're great, but they haven't been able to sustain an English language newsletter, so they clearly need support to do that. But it could be beyond just Kesh Malek. It could deal with civil society and the diaspora and exile. There's a new group, Global Syria, if people know that, but they, they kind of had a big start and then haven't been doing, like, I don't know if they, I, I don't, partly people might be doing this and I don't know. But connecting these stories of the local councils, like bringing them to people's attention in a systematic and regular and planned way, and then connecting that to local uh, humanitarian work. Um, I know for some of the Western European left, this, there was progress on how they related to the question of Syria when there was the um, Calais, I might be saying it wrong, Calais refugee camp and people would go, they, they were either confused or maybe lightly pro-Assad or something, but not, they weren't Assadists, but they had a bad position on Syria, a fake neutral one. But they saw the refugee problem, like the problems of refugee people was real, went to do relief work and then getting to know them they realized, oh shit, like I was wrong, like, I was wrong about this. And so one doesn't want to do that in an instrumentalized way, but like Syrian people need help. And so organizing socialists and other leftists to go do that work in a way that provides needed aid, but also provides a basis for like, you know, having a political discussion that's more meaningful than like an abstract polemic, um, I think could help. Jason, three minutes. Okay. And, um, the only other thing I'd say is particularly some of us are already talking to the Democratic Socialists of America about how to do this work better and to organize it better. So if people are interested in that aspect, you know, talk to me or talk to other people on how we can best organize that work, doing some of these same things but in that space. I mean, it's 30,000 mostly young socialist people, so if you want to get the socialist movement into solidarity with Syria and other places, that is the space to do it in. That's it. So, now we'll have our question and answer period. Um, we have.